Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So asked and answered, today we are gonna be talking about the Brat Remix album. I'm gonna try and guess the title real quick. Brat and it's exactly the same. Brat and it's completely different, except some of the songs are the same. <laughs> Brat and it's something backwards. This album title taught me that I cannot read backwards easily. Upside down is fine backwards whole different ballpark but anyway today we're gonna get into the remix album and i've already talked about brat og i guess we can call it and gave my thoughts on some of those songs all of them actually i think and talking about how some of them position charlie as this pop party princess but also some of them position her as someone who kind of you know sometimes sees the downsides to this party lifestyle and i think the remix album does the same thing and i'm gonna put a whole entire flash warning on this video since a lot of the lyric videos in the last one used a lot of strobing and intercut with me talking i will put some clips of charlie performing some of the songs i'm talking about let's get into brat and it's completely different and brat yeah here calling pick it up darling london calling when i go prance and yeah go all in all right, so let's get into the 360 remix with Robin and Young Lean. This one actually has been out for quite a while. It might have been the first remix we got, not quite sure. I wasn't too familiar with Young Lean, but I did find out that he's a Swedish rapper. And then Robin, of course, Swedish pop princess, pop pioneer. And I mean pop princess in general, not just of the Swedish pop girls. And I think that actually is a perfect reason why she is on the remix specifically of 360, because within 360, Charlie is talking about her place as this sort of pop icon, this pop tastemaker in a sense. Someone who's got that unabashed, unapologetic persona and believing that's why her music has worked out so well for her, for better or for worse, as we do talk about in this album and referenced pretty well by the opening lyric, I went my own way and I made it, which I love, sets the tone for the whole song. And to tie Robin back into this, and I touched on this in my Poptimism video, she's one of those artists who's kind of the reason why Poptimism exists. Poptimism being, okay, we can critique pop just like we can critique any other genre of music, and we can treat pop as being very diverse, just like we can with any other genre of music. And as Robin says a couple times in the song, like, I've been doing this shit since 1994. Why you do it so cold? They say I'm the realest ever, yeah. That's what I've been told. Killing this shit since 1994. And then even in his part, Young Lean is also echoing the sentiment saying, you know, who do I trust? Me. At the end of the day, I've got to be the one that's got more faith in my own artistry than anyone else. I've got to trust my vision, my direction, which is what 360 is all about. Not a lot of changes in the production. This one sticks pretty or stays pretty faithful to the standard version of 360. But anyway, I don't think that this remix necessarily changes the meaning of the original song, but I do think it emphasizes or reinforces it, dials it up just a bit. All right, next we have Club Classics featuring BB Tricks. Also was not familiar with BB Tricks, and I looked her up, and according to her wiki, she's a Spanish rapper, and it says she's notable for having funny and witty lyrics. So very different from 360. We do start with a very, I was gonna say a 180 on the production, but we do start off with some clear changes. To me, I noted that the beginning of the song kind of sounds like an alarm that would go off if you left an industrial door open in a factory or a restaurant, warehouse, something like that. The song actually samples quite a bit of 365, which I'm kind of like oh, wait that's a different song and i'm gonna assume or think or interpret that the reason for that is this is on a song called club classics and in the original charlie is paying homage not to any specific club classics but to the concept of a club classic as a whole and some of the producers collaborators that she's worked with who are who have been known to make club classics and i think it's pretty clear on the standard version of brad 365 which ends the album not only was it a sort of combination of 360, but it even more dialed up, even more clubby version of it, sort of representing that club lifestyle that Charlie has chosen that she involves herself in. Saying all that to say, I feel like we were supposed to glean from the album that 365 was intended to be a club classic with time or one of those songs that comes on in the club and you're gonna jump and you're gonna move. So I'm that. Three, six, five, party girl. That. Three, six, five, party girl. That. It'll push my head up back, back, back. And so far, the song has definitely done that. Seems like it's doing it for quite a few people. So I feel like including it in the Club Classics remix is kind of like, hey, I'm, I might have made me a little Club Classic. That being said, though, in some ways, I do still think, production-wise, this is a more chill version than the original Club Classics. That one, sometimes it would be 8.30 in the morning, and I'm like, why are you playing this in the car right now? But girl, you are also definitely awake now. And since it is softer, but it sounds like from what I've heard in this song, BB's got this like cuter, softer voice. So her verse works really well on this version of the song. <laughs> But then towards the end of the Club Classics remix, we do get a lot of those sort of rugged, mechanical, power tool sounding synths. 
So again, I don't think that the Club Classics remix is necessarily changing the meaning or the, or the perspective on the original, but I think the original is just kind of like, oh, I love Club Classics. I want to pay homage to them. I yearn for them to keep on coming. And then when we get to the remix, Charlie's like, hey, I feel like I might have made one more for y'all. It's a nice Let's get into the Sympathy is a Knife remix. When I say this is like my world's colliding, love Charlie, love Ari. Never thought I was gonna see them on a song together. Never would have even thought to imagine what a collaboration between them would have sounded like but I'm glad we got it. And on this one especially, I was just like hoping and praying. I was like, I want Charlie to re-record. I want some new lyrics. Charlie, straight out of the gate, we get new lyrics. We get a new meaning to this song, or I would say a new perspective on it. Because it seems like at first she was just kind of talking about, in a sense, her own views on herself in comparison to some other pop girls. I couldn't even be her if I tried, as in I am who I am. Sometimes I wanna be someone different. Sometimes I think it would be more lucrative to be someone different, but I just can't seem to change from who I am. But now in this song, we're getting Charlie, you've changed. Ari, you've changed. I honestly feel like both versions of the song are just kinda of like, damn, I can't win regardless. Like, I can't win for losing. But at least in the original, it's like she wasn't necessarily doing anything wrong. She's just like, I am who I am, and sometimes who I am is a little different. But in this one, it's almost like being vilified. Also how when the success starts, it's not just like, okay, finally, I've reached the summit of the mountain. I've done it. No, now you've got a whole host of new problems. And then Ariana's verse actually echoes quite a bit of the sentiment. And honestly, I was saying like, oh, I never thought that they would collaborate. And I think that is part of the reason I think Ariana's such an interesting choice because she is one of those mainstream pop girls that Charlie's probably like, I'll never be like her in a million years. We'll, we probably could never really find that much common ground even though our careers are relatively similar. And so Ari's kind of stepping in and being like, you know, a lot of the girls that you want to be like, the girl who seems like she has it all, you know, she's probably miserable too, or she could be just as miserable as you are, you never know. And not only does Ari's verse just echo, I feel like what are the common trial tribulations of being a pop star? You know, I wouldn't know, but based on what I've read. And then it also seems like looking at her verse, she's also talking about a lot of the speculations on her looks, on her body that she's had to, or tried to shut down, especially over the last year or so. It's a nice one, they does it. I feel like we've talked about this before this whole plastic surgery having work done thing in general it's something that like I don't have as much of a dog in this fight but it is something that does intrigue me because it feels like this weird moral conundrum of like yeah obviously it's commonplace in the entertainment industry now honestly just amongst people in general to have had work done do people have to disclose when they've had work done and part of me is just kind of like no that's your business but is it different if someone straight up asks you like oh have you had any work done and you're like no and you have because obviously lying being deceptive is technically typically wrong but should people have to answer questions especially about their bodies or anything like that that they don't necessarily want to answer now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like you could just be like, no comment, I would decline. But I also think in a lot of cases that isn't good enough or a lot of people would just take that as a yes. I feel like now I've seen some people be like, yeah, I've had some stuff done. I'm not gonna tell you what, or they'll be like, I've had this done, it was terrible. I have to get a corrected, don't get it. And while I'm not gonna sit here and I like, I believe every single time an artist or entertainer answers a question in an interview, they're telling the truth because that's definitely not true. I do agree with Ariana saying like, even if I told the truth, y'all wouldn't believe me anyway. I feel like even if a lot of these entertainers, they wrote down a list of 100% truthfully everything that they've had done, people would still be like, mm, no, I know that there's another little tweet that you did that you don't want to tell us about. And it's also interesting that this, I was going to say conversation, or at least that this topic is being brought up to, I guess, inspire conversations, because I'm sure I can't be the only person who's thought about this because it's in the lyrics. Some of us tend to compare our, let's say, our natural looks to looks that may not be natural to someone else, or wanting a feature that the other person themselves wasn't born with. And then the song itself, at large, is about comparing ourselves to other people who will never be. And we can get close, maybe in terms of fame, in terms of status, or the way that our life changes, just to realize that wasn't gonna be the quick fix. Having everything that they physically have, looking like them, having their career, doesn't make me any happier. I'm very glad that it sounds like a collaboration rather than a competition, just being like, Charlie XCX, Ariana Grande, the fans will love that, they'll gag, put it together. This one has a little bit more of a subdued, staticky sound throughout it all, and then it really goes insane in the last 30 seconds with a lot of these lasery sounds. <laughs> And 
then final thought on this song because obviously I had so many because I love it. I love both versions. The little it's a knife, like the British <laughs> accent. That got stuck in my head so easily. I was like, we're gonna see so many memes, we're gonna see so many jokes. It immediately reminded me of 21 Savage, and then as soon as the meme started hitting the internet, you know, sometimes when you hear something, you're like, I know exactly how the internet is gonna run with this, and then it happens. I think it's fun to see. I could say something small. So up next we have I Might Say Something Stupid, which features the 1975, and this time we have different producers on it. We have John Hopkins and George Daniel. And George, of course, is Charlie's fiance. And because these two producers, they weren't the ones who did the original, I was like, of course, this song is gonna sound completely different, or at least I expected it to, and it definitely does. The first half of the song is pretty dramatic, but also lyricless, and it sounds like, at least from what I know of the 1975, it sounds like like them, from what I know. And because of that absence and lyricism, that silence taking up so much of the song, I think it does really well to come off as like just lonely. It emphasizes that loneliness. It's not a waste of time, but it is definitely just this emptiness. You're just feeling, or just hearing static, that room tone, and you're kind of just sitting in it. And with Maddie's added lyrics in this version of the song, it just feels like someone who's like, okay, I can't say anything right in this relationship. I come over to see you. Nothing much is said. I'm inside my head because nothing I say feels right. And then I go home and I don't feel any better. I just rot in my house also. And as much as you're like sitting in this song, sitting in this feeling of loneliness, it also just feels kind of fleeting. But where you try to like, you're like waiting, you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna throw it out and then everyone's gonna laugh and I'm gonna feel part of the group. And then you finally get that little moment, you jump in, you say what you have to say, no one gives a shit. And the most it ever sounds like a real song or a traditional song in a sense is towards the end, like in the last 30 seconds. Now I'm watching what I say. And in my interpretation, like returning to the fleetingness of it all, like you spent so much time ruminating, stewing, and then towards the end, you finally get the courage to be like, you know what? Someone's always gonna think what I have to say is stupid. I'm just gonna join it, I'm just gonna vibe. And then you don't even get to fully realize it. And even though that's where you're finding your community, finally getting out of that shell, then it ends. Okay, here's the plan. I wanna fly you out to Amsterdam. Up next, we have the Talk Talk remix, which of course features Troy Sivan and an uncredited duo, Lipa. She, that's actually her voice doing the um, voice messages in Spanish. I can't remember if there's one in French. I feel like I don't have too, too many thoughts on this song. I thought the original was cute. I think this one is cute. As opposed to the original, I don't think the meaning of the song really changes here. I think in the standard version of Talk Talk, Charlie's just so in her head. She's trying to like telepathically <laughs> get George to talk to her, to ask her out. I feel like in this version of the song, it is more overt, it is more outward you know, choice talking about plot in. As far as the production changes, I like that there's more keys here, definitely leaning a little bit more into the dance style of this one. <laughs> Also, I like that the percussion is dialed up just a little bit. Kind of sounds like a thumping heartbeat, like you feel even more pressured to get your ex to talk to you, get your ex to get your crush to talk to you. I got to watch them perform it together because that's how they end the sweat tour. And it's very fun. I also feel like very rare when you hear a song that even has a featured artist, even if it's not a remix, where you actually get to see them both perform it together live. So I really enjoyed that. Just living that life. Fun, Dutch, cold, classic, but I still pop, pack the LBK. Okay, Von Dutch remix featuring Addison Rae and A.G. Cook. I did not know that a lot of people didn't really like the original version of Von Dutch or the standard version. I love it. And I think that's why I'm like kind of like, okay, this remix is cute, but to me, the original is top tier. My favorite part of this song is Addison's scream. Every time I've heard it, I'm just like, I wish I could do that. <laughs> Okay, this thought occurred to me now and I'm gonna share it. It's kind of like if you put the original Von Dutch in like a Yassifier, like a little blender that like infuses some glitter into it. And now instead of it sounding like the opening of like a 2000s live action movie with maybe some mean girls, but you feel like they're a little justified, it's now gonna be used for the opening credits of an animated Bratz movie. And honestly, I don't think the meaning of this song changes with the remix. I think it just doubles down on the original of the meaning. Like, you know, like I'm that bitch, take it or leave it. You know, you wanna call yourself a hater, you wanna identify as a hater, but really I feel like you're just like a fan in a hater costume energy. Everything is romantic featuring Caroline Polachek. I said, even though I'm not super familiar with Caroline Polachek, 
I was the most excited for this one or was one of the ones I was the most excited for because I know enough about Caroline Polachek to know that this was gonna make perfect sense. This song tore me in half. So if you can't tell, I love it, which is interesting because the original song, Everything is Romantic, it was a grower for me. And dare I say, this version of the song made me understand the original and appreciate the original even more. And so the song keeps that experimental electronic energy of the original Everything is Romantic, but it feels a lot more subdued. Originally, I noted that it almost has a sort of lo-fi vibe to it. And in her verse, Caroline, I'm gonna, oh my God, I know I'm gonna mix their names up. Caroline keeps the same structure as Charlie does where she's kind of just narrating this journey, narrating what she's seeing. But with Charlie in the original, it seems like this romantic getaway. But when Caroline starts, she walked to the studio so King wear a cab tag on a bus stop sign. And not necessarily in a way that she's complaining, but it's kind of like the stark reality to Charlie's romanticization. And then she gets a call from Charlie who's like, hey girl, like life is life and it finally hit me. And Charlie's like, I have it all. I have everything that I thought I wanted. I have a relationship that I'm really in love in, that I'm happy in. I have the album that I'm proud of. People are loving it, people are appreciating it. But why does it not feel like everything is perfect? Why do I feel like we were talking about sympathy is a knife in a lot of ways, even more anxious than I felt when I was hungry for the success that I have now. And I feel like essentially the thesis of this whole song is this lyric. I'm trying to shut off my brain. I'm thinking about work all the time. It's like you're living the and so she's checking in with herself saying, is everything romantic? And I don't think it's necessarily romantic as in like, you know, flowers and roses, romances and that sort of love like we're talking about in the original version of the song, but also romantic as in fictionalized, romanticized version of my life that I thought I was gonna live once I just made that album that everybody loved, that everybody appreciated. I do think that we, myself included, are really good at convincing ourselves that like once we just have that one thing, everything will fall into place. And then you get it and you're like, damn, <laughs> that wasn't what happened. And this song kind of just interpreted as an honest conversation between two friends, even though it is more artistic than that. Like the song is playing out in a conversation. And I feel like a lot of us have these similar conversations with our friends and honestly with ourselves. Move like test mirror, loose me on Maybe I need a reality check. Sometimes no, I just gotta say that. Up next, we have Rewind featuring Blade, who is the Swedish rapper. I hope it's pronounced Blade and is just stylized. Production wise, this remix is very similar in spirit to the original version of Rewind. I would say they maybe dialed up the stimulation just a touch. And I think that works in this song to kind of make you feel like you're more in your head, more overstimulated. Because the concept of both versions of the song is that you are overwhelmed and you want to dial back to a simpler time. This thing that she was dying for, that she was dreaming for, aiming for, working for, she's essentially got it. She's got the yes to her question, do I deserve commercial success? And she's received it. But now she's just like, okay, now I got more th more things to worry about. All this money makes me competitive. Gotta get more living all excess. I must confess I'm on the stress. It's not Charlie saying it, it's also Blaze saying it in this song where he's like, the mirror leaves me unimpressed. And of course, thinking of mirrors, you think back to 360. And yeah, in that version, it's Charlie singing. And it's this very cheeky way of her saying, I inspire you. You model a little bit of what you do after me. I'm the inspiration, I'm on your mood board. And here it's being said in a song about wanting to go back to a happier time that she's not necessarily impressed where she is in the current. Lyrics back and forth on text. Now I wanna think about all the good times like the first time I heard your music. Up next we have So I Always features AG Cook and of course this song is a tribute to Sophie. But just the thought of having a mentor who's not just a mentor but a friend and still having a lot of these things that's that are left unsaid but almost everything you do because they've become such a big part of you, you think about them all the time. I couldn't imagine that. Production wise, again, this version of So I does keep a lot of the spirit of the original, but it is a bit sped up. And there are some parts where it sounds kind of static -y, almost like the helium is leaving a balloon or something. We're running out of time. Again, there is this sense of rushing because there is temporality, but very differently from the original version. In this song, and she says it often in the lyrics, is like, I wanna focus on the good times. I wanna celebrate, you know, those little stupid outfits that I wore, but you know what? We had an amazing night out and I thought I looked amazing then, and that's all that matters. Like, it's like, of course you have regrets, the biggest regret being that y'all don't have more time together, but within that friendship, because it was so important, because it was so integral, you do have a lot of things that you absolutely don't regret at all. And I love how we get all of these 
perspectives on Charlie's relationship with Sophie because like I said friend mentor also fan because she mentions in the song that her ex-boyfriend introduced her to uh, Sophie's music before Charlie even got the opportunity to work with Sophie. It's just a very touching thing to see someone admit that they were so moved by a friend and loved a friend so deeply and felt so loved by their friend. It told me how you been feeling let's look it out on the remix. All right, up next we have Girls So Confusing, which of course features Lord. I don't know if I necessarily have that many new thoughts on this song. Again, the production doesn't change too, too much as compared to the original. And again, out of it, we've gotten this whole concept of working it out on the remix, you know, when that's feasible. And I do think it's very easy, at least for me, sometimes to sort of project your insecurities into the other person or like why they're mad at you why they're upset with you or don't want to talk to you or this that or the third and then it literally wasn't even that or anything close and i really love that through releasing the song talking about it charlie actually got to mend her relationship with lord which we see on the remix So next we've got Apple featuring the Japanese house. Another artist I wasn't too familiar with. I just thought that they were a band because it just sounds like a band name. No, it is one person. I love Apple Down. Clearly that is not a hot take because the song is viral. And for the most part, the original version of the song is in metaphor. Her using an apple and apples in general as a metaphor for a lot of family issues and traumas passed down that she's almost kind of nervous of passing down if she starts a family one day. But with a lot of the um, additions and inclusions from the Japanese house, we get a lot more literal with it. Like there's some lines on the song that just say you make me feel sad the lyric i picked out of this one was somebody asked me how you were doing and i make excuses and i say fine and i think that's why i love its inclusion in the song because it feels like such a small thing something we do all the time but it really hints to how a lot of us aren't necessarily open about some of the issues that we have in relationships and you just have so much you want to say you have so much you want to get out but you're just like is this the time is this the place so when someone's like oh how so and so you're like oh they're fine and again we get charlie kind of not necessarily explaining but talking about yeah i never feel understood i don't feel wanted here that's why i love to drive that's why i love vehicles i love cars helicopters buses planes trains anything that will get me out of here in a way i almost feel like this remix could have been a bridge like inserted into the original version of apple but i love it if I clap, now everybody wants what we got Cause we make bing clap, make get too on Up next we have Back to Back with Tinashe And I'm like, girls, it's been 10 years since Drop That Kitty We've been rewarded for our patience So the production isn't as like lashing and swinging as the original But one thing I love about this is it sounds kind of like Droplet era Charlie It sounds kind of like Lost Era XEX World Charlie This could have been a B-side to like Focus or Girls Night Out or something like that and so in the original, I don't necessarily think back to back was talking about a love triangle, but just that in between of a relationship where it's like, okay, I could go back to this other person. I could move on to be with this other person. The other person could go back to whoever they were with before. They could move on and be with me. And similarly, you feel lost in this production, but you don't feel like weighed down by it, but you feel like you're floating. You're in your own little world. And I think it really leans itself well to the, to the sort of new perspective on this song where it's like, we got back to back shows. We're booked, we're busy, we're that girl. And they got the song done in two days and they've both had those moments where they sort of you know this song blows up and everyone's like oh oh that song blows up and everyone's like oh my god are they and sometimes i feel like playing this little will they won't they become like that next number one pop girl i feel like it's not necessarily a productive game because the reason we have a song like this is because for at least 10 years both of them respectively have been able to continue to grow as artists have been able to make music because they have fans who push them forward, who want to see something new from them, who want to see something different and just get excited to watch them either just reinvent themselves and not even that sometimes, just to continue to realize themselves as artists. I would bet it's cool just having someone out there who's like, okay, we're not the same exact artist, but there's someone out there who kind of has, in a way, a relatively parallel career to mine, who gets those highs, who gets those lows, who gets those battles. I feel like this is one of the songs on the remix album where she is like able to look back and be like, you know what? Even though everything is not perfect, damn, I really did that. We really did that. Up next, we have Mean Girls featuring Julian Casablanca's from The Strokes. 
Also, if you don't know of him or if you don't know the Strokes, John Casablanca's modeling company, that's his father. And again, Mean Girls is one that I loved from the original. Love just the experimentation of it, the electro clash of it all, the keys of it all. Like that break, that bridge is my favorite part of the song. So I almost did a backflip when the remix opened with it. Adding in that kick drum, I can't articulate very well why Like I love that inclusion in the song. But it's like you hear the piano keys at first and you're just like, okay, okay, okay. But then the drums start and you're like, okay. And you start moving. Like it's kind of like... Like, you know the song is already started, but adding in that layer of percussion, it's like, okay, now we're really getting started. I'm not 100% solid yet on my interpretation of this song, but where I'm at right now is I feel like Charlie is the mean girl in question and Julian is playing the role of someone who's dating one of these mean girls and it's kind of giving up because nothing they ever say or do can be right. I'm not saying that he's not part of the issue either. And before all of this, he, you can tell that he's got the same sense of reckless abandon that Charlie has, or you know the roles that they're sort of playing in this song. And it's like one of those things like two things can be the truth because it's like you can be part of the problem you can be acting in a way that's not conducive to a relationship or what you really should be doing but then on the other hand that person can be kind of egging you on to do it you know encouraging you to do it maybe they decide it's not for them one day and want it in that relationship because they're like hey actually this isn't for me which maybe doesn't absolve them of having engaged with you in the past, but it doesn't mean they have to keep doing it either. And because there is so much going on in the standard version of Mean Girls, it is a good thing that this song is equally as stimulating. We get a lot of like weird electronic distortions with Julian's vocal. A lot of those keys are kept. I think it works because it creates this element of distortion, but also makes things feel like a game or like a show, like they're lighthearted and funnier than they really are. So even if some serious things are being said in the song, some serious emotions are being expressed, you kind of don't want to take it seriously. Yeah, that's where I'm at now with the song. Maybe with more listens, my opinions will change, but I'm interested to hear how y'all have interpreted this remix. All right, up next we have I Think About It All The Time featuring Bon Iver, and I was just like, oh shit, when I saw that he was the featured artist on this song. I will admit, I haven't listened to them as much recently, but I had a huge Bon Iver phase in high school. So I was like, if it's anything like that, I'm just gonna be even more emotional than I already am listening to this album. And as soon as he was like, when did it get so hard? I was like, yup, you can say that again. When did it get so hard? And throughout the song, it feels like this sort of back and forth between Justin Vernon, who's the lead singer, and Charlie, where Justin's asking these reflective questions to Charlie and she's answering them. The same answers that she provided in the original version of the song, but now with this even heightened sense of fear, this heightened sense of, I don't have time for everything I wanna do. And now that the album is out, now that the remix album is also out, Charlie's on tour promoting the album, doing all of this. First off, you're bound to the album locked into the promo next thing three years have gone back. and so then at that point do i hang it up and say you know what george i am ready to start a family or does that album cycle end and you know we just slide on into another one and the line i picked out from this one is where she sings but there's so much guilt involved when we stop working because you're not supposed to stop when things start working. And I think also the when did it get so hard that Bon Iver is questioning is how life, especially adulthood, at a certain point it becomes making a series of choices that could have years long impacts on your life and those are not easy decisions to make. And talking about the production, the original or the standard version if I think about it all the time, I said that I love the almost unfair finished, unpolished quality of it. It kind of sounds like a passing thought, like these musing that Charlie is having when she's just walking to her friend's house or something. Not saying like, oh, this is the first time that wanting a family has ever occurred to me. But the production here sounds even deeper, more overwhelming. Like it's not like, oh, I was, it just popped in my mind while I was on a walk today. Now it's like, no, it's 4 a.m. And I've been laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, thinking about this for hours. And I feel like the walls are closing in and I don't have time to just be like, oh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Like now I need to make a decision. So not necessarily a new perspective here on this song. I think doubling down and just her realizing, okay, this album, the success continuing on with this career, as I get older, as the relationship progresses, that might just make things even more difficult. It might make my deciding even difficult if she's still like, I have no idea what I'm going to choose, what I want to go for, what I want to do. Three, six, five, go, 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 go
All right, now we're into the 365 remix with Shy Girl. Honestly, 365, the original version, the standard version, already gives a remix because it's an interpolation. It's a song that's in conversation with 360, the two songs that book in Brat. I've seen a lot of people describe that break in the middle or towards the end of 365 as like when the substance hits, and I agree with that, and I feel like that same spirit is definitely here in the 365 remix. This song also sounds like what strobing and strobe lights, this song sounds like what they look like in my opinion. Shy Girl, of course, is the perfect person to echo this. Got to see this live again. Love when I get to see like the two artists on the song perform it live and they just have fun. My only critique on the song is I want Shy Girl to be a little louder just because the production is so overstimulating. But you know, maybe she's quiet because she's a shy girl. I don't know, it's just a very like, hey twin, like nobody can party harder than me song. So I definitely think it keeps the spirit of the original song, dials it up just a tad. The ones I picked out for you in Tokyo, I saw them when you sat Okay, then we also have the guest remix. I keep forgetting that this is a remix because it came out relatively quickly after the extended version of the album. And this one, again, it's fun. Little tongue in cheek, little thong in cheeks, if you will, about how everyone's got a little different vibe going on with their underwear. You know, of course, if we're seeing the underwear, we're probably gonna be getting into some other things. Very sleazy, very clubby. I talked about this song when I did my video on the indie sleaze resurgence because of Charlie and Billy, of course, but also because it is produced by The Dare. And speaking about the clubbiness of this song, listen to it like a bunch of times I was like I feel like this reminds me of another older like EDM pop song I think it's satisfaction but yeah very fun song like I said I forget it's a remix and you know Billy driving a bulldozer into a pile of undies pretty camp we going psycho we going off yeah me and Charlie with the pretty girl God don't baby you mad just hours after I recorded this video, we got the pleasant surprise of the Kesha remix of Spring Breakers dropping. Here, there aren't too many massive production changes, but I love how it almost feels like Kesha's controlling the flow of the song around her verses. And she actually does get the first verse in the song. Kesha positions herself as a musical risk taker, one who's often emulated, has a cult following, but hasn't always received the critical acclaim to back it up, especially in her earlier days. As far as Grammy specifically, which Charlie was talking about in the original Spring Breakers, Kesha nods to her 2018 nominations for Praying and Rainbow. Making me sick, nominated, all the motherfuckers better be praying, singing my song. But still, she maintains art is not a competition. So this one really feels like both Charlie and Kesha being like, you know, I'm very comfortable with the music I've made and the impact I have thus far, even if I never win another award, but it also wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if I did because no matter what, she and Charlie will still be the party girl gods. And again, Kesha is expressing her freeness, how she's back in control now of her career. And according to some online, says the word bitch enough times in this verse to make for a pretty fun drinking game. All right, so overall things, if it's not clear, I definitely had quite a few thoughts on this remix album. I feel like a lot of these songs are perfect for fall. Like Charlie was like, okay, I know they're gonna get the album in mid-October. I wanna give them some fall vibes. We're gonna do Brat Autumn, if you will. Another thing that I like is I kept being like, oh, I'm not too familiar with this artist. I'm not too familiar with that artist. Also makes it feel like these are actual artists that Charlie listens to or she likes them or respects them. And it isn't like, okay, I just want people to tweet about this. I want the name recognition. Also really like how it spans the gamut of Robins and the Bony Bears who have been around for forever and ever. And then some newer artists. And quite a few of the featured artists, I think the majority of them, like Tanache is one who doesn't fit this rule, but I think quite a few of them do. Also Robin and Young lean wooden but a lot of them do a lot of the times they make the song feel sadder more despondent than it was initially one probably because that was the creative direction for the song two i would also think that charlie probably gave these people creative control or leeway and what they wanted to bring to this song wasn't necessarily something that was bright everything is perfect everything is happy and i say all that to say not like oh we need to find these celebrities and give them a group hug if you want that's your mo being like once i have a life like ariana grande's once i have a life like charlie xcx's all of my problems will go away that is not the case it's nice to have that perspective but maybe it's not as productive to spend your time wanting someone else's life wanting what they have because they might not even want it, they might not even be happy with it, and it might not even be something that makes you happy were you to have it. Oh, I almost forgot to put top five here, top five, top five songs, remixes, well, they are still songs, right here. So yes, those are my thoughts on Brat, and it's completely different, except some of the songs are different, but not really, so it's still Brat. I know that was wrong as hell. So those are my thoughts on Brat, and it's completely different, but also still Brat. I would be eager to hear your thoughts and everything that you want to let me know down below in the comments. That way we can chat about Brett. 
As always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can stick around for more. And if you'd like to become a channel member and get early access to videos, the link is in the description. Again, thank you so much for watching. I love you all so very much, and we'll see you so very soon. Bye-bye.